So welcome again, everyone. And uh, tonight's presentation is filtering and focusing our photon culling. Uh, this is some very basic information. Uh, I guess you could say using the term culling is kind of a jaded approach to it, but uh, it's describing instruments that we use for collecting photons and selecting which photons we're going to record and how that works um, at the uh, almost at the quantum level. So here, here's the uh, reason why I use the word culling. Um, culling is, is basically you have a large collection of things that are similar and you want to reduce that collection by removing items that don't meet some particular refinement criteria. Um, you know, where, where it really comes from is livestock management, agricultural management, but I'm using it in, in relationship to astronomical observing and saying, what photons do I want to keep, record, observe, and what photons do I not want? So it, it's typical that when you call items, they're uh, discarded or destined for some other purpose or markets. Um, the called items may still have some value, just not to those defining the refinement criteria. As uh, I've mentioned in previous presentations, um, there are a lot of astronomical observations that were recorded over time that are sufficient for us to go back and look for new kinds of stuff in them. So, you know, you, you may have been looking at, uh, for example, star clusters, but if you're looking for particular kinds of stars in the cluster, or maybe you know position movement changes in those stars, you may actually go back and look at the data searching for um, exoplanets within that same data. So even though it was initially filtered out as not being important for the original observing, you may come back later and find, if I change my refinement criteria, I now have new data that was ignored or uh, discarded the first time. But our focus will be on astronomical culling of photons. So we have to start with getting that collection of photons. So a telescope, be it a refractor or a reflector, or a catadioptric, or even a radio telescope, or an X-ray telescope, or a gamma telescope, all or even just simple binoculars, all of these are photon collection creators. They gather photons and then you have to do something with them. So they gather photons using their primary, their primary lens, their primary mirror, their primary reflector. Um, they collect that and that defines a field of view. So that's the, the uh, part of the sky that they're grabbing data from. They're gonna grab photons out of that. And the mechanism for grabbing the photons may be different based upon it being radio or infrared or optical or ultraviolet or X-ray or gamma. Um, but once the photons are all collected, um, you deliver them to one or more photon culling mechanisms. So you've got the, the raw collection of photons, and now you want to like throw out the photons you don't want and keep the photons that you do want and you know, maybe select particular kinds of photons that you want. So what you'd use is reflectors, baffles, slits, beam splitters, focusers, filters, gratings, all of these are tools for culling photons, getting rid of the photons you don't want, or focusing on the photons that you do want. So first we'll start with reflectors, baffles, and slits. So over here on the right, I've got some graphical representation of the various kinds of these things. Uh, the white represents the field of view being gathered, and the black represents the part that you're culling, you're getting rid of. So in the, in the case of most telescopes, they'll have a baffle or a baffle tube um, where the light coming in may have additional light coming in from the sides or off angle. And you, you don't want that to be like noising up what you're actually going to be capturing. So you have a baffle, you have a baffle tube or a baffle ring, and it's just a, a giant disc with a hole in the center of it that allows the good light to be kept and the, the light you don't want to just be uh, absorbed by the black ring as heat and discarded as infrared. So it calls out the stuff around the outside. 
Or you can do it the other way around, like a coronagraph, where you say, I want to keep all the bright stuff around the outside, but that big bright star that's in the center, I want a disk that's opaque that blocks out the light from that star. We have uh, new versions of that, that instead of it being a single disk, if you've got multiple bright things, you've got uh, shutters, little individual, you know, thousands of individual little shutters that you can electronically open and close. So if you've got a bunch of bright stars in a field and you're looking for nebulosity, uh, you can block out all the bright stars and just keep all the nebulosity. It also allows you to adjust your exposure level. So if, if you have bright stars and dim gas and you want to pick up the dim gas, you increase your exposure duration. But if you don't block out those bright stars, it, depending upon the kind of imagery you're using, you may get spikes, you may get lines through the image where you're, you're basically overflowing the receptor. Most people with cameras are familiar with this one. This is an iris. It's a multi-sided, multi-veined um, set of panels that you electronically control to open up or close to a certain amount. And that blocks out the outside light that you don't want to allow you to more focus on the light in a particular part of the subject. And then if you're doing spectroscopic work, all you really want is that bright stuff in the center. So you'll have a slit or a hole um, that's just going to give you the light that you want and discard all the rest. So that's like kind of the first stage of culling is get rid of all the gross stuff that you don't want. But what if you want to deliver it to multiple things? Uh, you have splitters. So it takes in the photons. It doesn't duplicate the photons. It literally takes the density and splits up the photons and some go this way and some go that way as a prism would do this typically. But as a beam splitter, you're, you're literally taking the light in and then cleaving the light at a density level. So, you know, some percentage will go this way, some percentage will go this way. And it's quite typical that they're 50-50, but depending upon how you set up the optics and what tinting you put in the actual optical material, you may split it differently. Or you may want um, the infrared light going one direction, the visible light going another. So a beam splitter will redirect some of the photons to different instruments from the others. So it's not really culling to get rid of them, it's culling to separate them out and give some to one instrument and some to another. This one I could have uh, shown focusing, but um, th this is something I think that we don't quite understand well enough in physics. Um, a focuser is literally culling by age of photons. So if, if, if you think of it as, if you have a camera and you're taking a picture of a distant target through a chain link fence, you can adjust the focus on your camera to look at the distant target and the chain link fence literally disappears. Or you can zoom the focus back the other way and the distant target goes out of focus and the chain link fence is in sharp view. So focus is literally saying, I want these photons or I want those photons or some in the middle. And that's why I refer to it as age of the photons because the light literally coming from the source that you're capturing data from is either photons that are closer to you in origination, so they're newer, younger photons, or they're really distant, as in coming from the moon or coming from a planet in our solar system, or they're even more distant. They're coming from another object in our galaxy, or even more distant, they're you know, millions to billions of light years away. So they're really old photons. And if you think about focusing and you've ever done focusing using a telescope, you'll realize that if I want to focus on the moon, I got to crank the focus back a lot. And then when I want to change my focus to look at, let's say, Jupiter, crank it, you know, half, halfway out the other direction to get Jupiter in sharp focus. And then if I want to look at Saturn, it's like, crank it a little bit more. Now, if I want to look at the Orion Nebula, it's 
just a little more. But now if I want to look at something like another galaxy, it's almost no change in focus. So that would say that the focusing at a physics level is nonlinear, because if it was linear, then given that you're increasing the distance that you want the photons from by millions to billions of light years, you should need a very huge change, but it's quite the opposite. The further away, the older the photons, the smaller the change in focus to get them into focus. So my thought is, and it's just a postulation, there's got to be another property of photons that we don't comprehend yet that says the index of refraction of the material that you're throwing the photons through, you know, if, if you have young photons, the index of refraction has a great influence on the photon and bending it. But if it's an older photon, whatever that property is, that attribute is, it's a lot less because that photon's been around for a long period of time. So much less change needed to focus it. But that's just my postulation. And then filters and gratings. So once you've said, I took the light that I wanted, I got rid of the light that I didn't want, uh, and then I focused it to get the particular age of photons that I want. Now I've got my target that I'm looking at. Now, how do I want to look at that target? Do I want to look at that target full spectrum with whatever came in? Do I want to look at it in a particular color band? Um, do I want to say, it's a bit bright. Can you dim it down a bit? Um, you know, uh, Or do I want to say, I want to do this spectroscopically, so I want to split the light into a rainbow and record the rainbow. I want to take the light that's coming in and not just beam split it, but wavelength split it. So these are filters and gratings. If I, can, if I want to look at a, uh, a particular target, I can filter it by color. So I can say, let's say I, I want to see everything that's blue. Um, I'll put a blue filter on there and things that are not blue will get darker. Things that are blue will, will come through at full brightness so it'll look brighter. So I, if I do that, I can then take my red, green, and blue filters and then merge them together later and go back to color. But I can also do things like, eh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of infrared in here and the infrared is saturating my particular sensor, uh, a CMOS type camera. So I'll throw an infrared blocking filter that will get rid of all of the um, long wave energy that's saturating my um, imager. Or you can get rid of all of this stuff that is not what you want. You're looking for a particular narrow field like hydrogen alpha. So you're going to block out anything that isn't within a band spread of hydrogen alpha. Or if I'm looking at the moon, I just want to say the moon is really bright because I'm looking at a full moon. And I want to see detail of the craters and the rills and the mountains. So I will dim down. I will take a certain amount of the photons that are coming in and literally convert them to heat by having them hit a level of gray to block them and transfer them from bright into heat, which is infrared that I can't see. So I dim it down. But now if I want to look at spectroscopically, I'm going to take that field of view and I'm going to take the wavelengths and I'm going to split them into different lines so I can see the individual absorption and emission levels. So that's the kind of culling and separating that uh, filters and gratings do. Now, here is a purposed photon coloring, uh, culling. This is a hydrogen alpha solar telescope. So down here at the bottom, you'll see, here's the full electromagnetic spectrum. Well, we know we're not going to be looking in gamma or X-ray or UV, and certainly not in radio, because we've got an optical telescope. But the optical telescope the visible bits is this wide black line. So that's the visible range. That's what the human eye can see. And this little tiny red thin line that's down here where it says HA, that's hydrogen alpha. That's the only part that we want. So we start with all the light coming towards the telescope. The first thing we do is 
we decide what band do I really want? Well, hydrogen alpha is a very precise value at 656.28 nanometers. That's the wavelength. That's, um, that's in air. In vacuum, it's slightly different, but let's just say 656. But if I want to look at solar prominences that are going away from me as they're going over the curvature of the sun, or if I want to look at solar prominences that are coming towards me, they're actually Doppler shifted. So I don't want that specific frequency or wavelength. I want a little bit of band pass. I want a little width on that. So I actually want to look at 616 to 697. Now, that's going to put it very close to dark red. Red is actually 620 to 700. So it's towards the um, shallow end of infrared, the near infrared. So that's why when you look at a hydrogen alpha telescope, it looks very dark red because it is dark red. So in next week's presentation, we'll actually talk about how you would make that better using quantum physics. Um, but it's dark red. So I can take out more of the stuff that I don't need, including the infrared bits. So all the light comes in. And the first thing I do on, my, on the front of my HA telescope is I put an energy reduction filter or an ERF. What it's going to do is obstruct in an opaque manner all the stuff we don't want. So aside from the band that is HA, we're going to throw away all the infrared, all the ultraviolet, and most of the visible, you know, 99% of the visible is going to be thrown away by the very first filter we have at the front of the telescope. Now, once we get that narrowed down to that 616 to 697 range, our notch for hydrogen alpha, the next thing we're going to do is it goes through a thing on the back end called an etalon. An etalon is literally two mirrors that one of the mirrors is fixed and the other mirror is on a tilt and the light goes down between the mirrors and it bounces back and forth in between the mirrors. One of the mirrors is 100% reflective and the other mirror is a little less than 100% reflective. And you can tilt the mirror and as you tilt it, the bouncing back and forth actually operates, if you remember the early days of uh, ruby red lasers. They had a laser rod that a flash tube would excite and produce photons. And the front mirror on the, uh, the end of the rod was a little less than fully reflective. And the mirror on the back was fully reflective. And the photons would bounce back and forth inside there until only the photons with the appropriate wavelength that can have the energy level to pass through the slightly less reflective mirror. Well, that's actually what the etalon is doing. It's acting like a little um, interference filter to allow the photons to bounce back and forth down through the two mirrors until they come out at the slightly less than 100%. And what that actually gives you is a band pass of eight nanometers. Now, why, why do you need it to be narrowed down that small? Because if you actually looked at the entire range of 616 through 697, it would look like it's out of focus. It would be a photon fog in hydrogen alpha. But you, you just want to see very sharp detail. So you don't want all of the photons that have been Doppler shifted by all of the, the uh, energy levels. You want just a few of them. So you want that narrow. That's why you have to tilt the mirror. It's not a fixed mirror because depending upon, I want to look at the photons that are going away, or I want to look, look at the photons that are coming towards me. You want to adjust the center tuning of that eight nanometers to see only the good stuff. And you're going to throw away everything else. So you're purposefully taking all that solar photon collection coming in the front of the telescope, and you're throwing away 99% of it right off the bat. And then of the 1% that's left, you're throwing away probably 80% of that. 
to get you just the sweet spot. So that's the most purposed photon culling I could come up with is an HA scope. So now that we've got all the good stuff and thrown away all the stuff that we don't want, we need to record it. Some of the recording is actually further culling the photons because they're not 100% precise. For example, back in the day when we used analog photographic film or coated glass film plates, um, compounds, silver halides, um, would become less transmissive or darker when exposed to photons uh, based upon the photoelectric effect and the chemistry of the silver halides. Well, the silver halides aren't perfect. They're chemistry, they're little clumps of material. So if you get not a 100% uniform um, surface that you can have brighter and darker areas when you really zoom in on your film, you could have brighter and darker areas and they'd refer to this as the grain of the image. So you don't want to get down to the point where you can see the grain of the image because now you're into the like the spots that are good and bad. So photographic film had grain, which says once you get down to that size, film kind of loses its uh, quality of image. So in digital, as we bump up the number of pixels, we increase, you know, we decrease the size of that grain. So we now have digital imagery that it's actually better than chemistry, even though it's still chemistry, it's still a photoelectric effect. So the photons come in, they strike the pixels, the image receptors, and they cause a transition to um, voltage. And the voltage gets either switched or, start, or charged by a capacitor. But the capacitor is not 100% some percentage of the capacitor will actually get converted to infrared heat. So they're not perfect. They're doing the best they can with the materials they have, but some of it through normal design is lost. So you have to have more light coming in if you want to take longer to capture the photons. Strangely enough, the human eye has rods and cones, which are more like chemical versions of digital receptors because rods and cones have a certain density. They have a certain like pixel density of your retina. So I, I categorize the eye in with all the digital stuff because the digital stuff is still chemistry. But cameras have pixels. You have CMOS or CCD types. And I actually have a, a link to explain the difference between CMOS and CCD for those people that want to really get into it. You have spectrometers, and spectrometers can also these days be CMOS or CCD. And if you want to gather just one pixel's worth, you can use photometers, which is a, a photodiode is a single pixel um, gathering device. Now, once you get the data and you convert it from analog into digital, you now have a value. And then you want to take those values and make a picture of it or make a, a spectrograph of it or just make a brightness source of it. And now you can record that as numerical data because that's the stuff that will last long term. But at the base level, since you're only recording voltage, all the recording is grayscale. It's just a voltage level. You get color by having filters on the front of it. You narrow it down to a certain band by having filters on the front of it. So, you know, I, I look at all sorts of imaging and sure you can map energy levels to approximate different colors, or you can false color wavelengths that the human eye cannot perceive and make things like X-rays violet. But the actual data being recorded is simply analog as a measure of voltage in that sensor. So that's great. So in conclusion, culling is basically taking a bunch of stuff that's similar and reducing it down through a criteria to the stuff that you want, just the good stuff. 
Telescopes and binoculars create collections of photons, a field of view. Photon culling mechanisms are all the stuff that make up the front end and back end of telescopes. They're reflectors, baffles, slits, uh, refractors, lenses, focusers, filters, and gratings. A specific type of telescope is a hydrogen alpha solar prominence observing telescope, and it has a bunch of different kind of photon culling mechanisms all throughout the telescope. Once you get the information culled down to just the good stuff that you want, you now have recording devices on the back end that are not 100% efficient. So some of it is going to be inadvertently called. And what you record at a digital or a film level is all that you're going to get. That's all you've got. And in the case of uh, most of the recording mechanisms, they're all grayscale. So to make something color, you have to put color back into it, or you have to put a color filter on the front of it. And when you put a color filter on the front of it, it's like saying, hey, I just put a red filter on there. Well, in this particular capture, we're going to throw away everything that's not red. More culling. So once you understand astronomical instruments at this very basic level of photons come in, you throw away the stuff you don't want, you record the stuff that you do want, as good as you're going to get. Once you understand that basic concept, you can look at any of these future telescopes or instruments and uh, get a good handle on them rather quickly when they start talking about things like bandpass filters or spectroscopic slits or coronagraphs or you know particular instruments like the Hubble or the Webb or Sophia or in radio, ALMA or in X-ray, Chandra or in gamma, Fermi. These are all just instruments that are gathering photons of different wavelengths, different frequencies, and then throwing away the stuff they don't want and through photoelectric effect or chemistry, recording the stuff that's left. That's about as telescope basics as you're going to get. Very nice. So that's me. And then we have some hyperlinks for more information. So I've got the photoelectric effect. Thank you, Einstein. And then the chemistry and biology of vision. So if people want to know how do eyes work, this is how eyes work at the chemistry level. The source for this is kind of interesting. NIH.gov is the U.S. government's National Institutes of Health. Photographic film, how those silver halides work and how they get them to work even in color. And then the distinction between complementary metal oxide semiconductors, or CMOS, or charge couple devices, or CCD, and why you know, one's different than the other. And uh, CCDs are getting to be very expensive, and they're kind of bumping their head on how many pixels they can get in an imager. Whereas CMOS, the individual pictures are much smaller, and you can pack more of them in, and make it even cheaper. So there, I, I was reading where the next generation of mobile phone cameras, CMOS cameras, will be 200 megapixel. And they'll have several cameras on the phone. So you might have, as your primary white light, wide field camera, you might have a 200 megapixel camera. But your portrait camera may be only 50 megapixels and have a fixed lens that gets a different field of view. So you'll switch between them. And they imagine how much memory you need to carry around. Right, the storage, yep. Yes, <laughs> gigabytes is going to be terabytes. And then if for those people that really want to know more about hydrogen alpha and why it's, it's significant, there's a, a link to a Wikipedia article on hydrogen alpha. And then for those people that don't hear enough from Helen and I about Sophia and infrared. You can learn more about infrared. The, the other cool thing about hydrogen alpha, if you look at a French guy, his name is uh, uh, Thierry, Thierry. Oh my God. I'm going to have to give your name again because I forgot. Uh, he does a hydrogen alpha yes. pictures. There are Thierry Lego. I, I remember the name of it now. Uh, 
And he does pictures where you have the background of the sun in, in hydrogen alpha. He takes the flares and gives the detail. But he also looks up for events happening on a space station that's going to cross the sun. So he has pictures of the silhouette of the space station with the spacecraft while having the picture of the sun in infrared. He does like amazing picture. He does the same with the moon and all the objects. His pictures are special because it's not just the pretty pictures, it's the well timing, well timed pretty pictures. The, the, his, his pictures are amazing because he needs to know where the shadow of that object is going to hit the area where he can drive. So he needs to triangulate the position of the shadow so he's under it to take the picture. It's like, wow, it's a, it's a, it's a, a lot of calculations. So the, the uh, <clears throat> Atlas Heavy that launched from California recently, somebody was good enough to actually get a shot of the rocket crossing the diameter of the sun. So the rocket is silhouetted and the sun was uh, in hydrogen alpha. So you get to see the sun with the glow of prominences around it. And the rocket literally is just the right size to fit within the diameter of the sun. Oh, cool. Okay, and thanks for watching. <laughs>